Welcome to Broken Spoke, the last of the true Texas dance halls, and damn sure proud of it. We ain't fancy, but we're darn sure our country. The good news is we ain't gonna change nothing. We ain't got none of them hanging fern baskets on our ceilings out here. None of that pier water either. When you go up on your hamburger, don't ask for that gray poupon. We're getting the real mustard out here. But let me tell you what we do got. We got cold beer, good whiskey. We're all the home of the best chicken fried steak in town. And we got good country music. We got Dale Watson tonight. Dude. On the south side of Boston, every Texan knows. If you want a two-step, go find the broken school. When they look up the places that sort of define Austin as a musical destination, the spoke is going to be the very top of the list. I came from across the damn country to come to Austin, Texas in order to play at the broken spoke. We got people that come from all over the world to hear this music. It's because it's better. There's proof of that. And a single one of you sons of bitches is going to go home tonight and listen to the music of Utah. You're just not going to do it. We're kind of rolling into our 50th year right here at the Broken Spoke. We've had people like Bob Wills right here, Willie Nelson, George Strait, Nolly Parton, Ernest Hub, Dick Fitter, the list goes on and on and on. That's a true Texas dance song. What Jake White explained. That red rustic building. It will never change. James and Annetta have kept that tradition going where you feel like you're going to a neighborhood. A uh, place that feels down home and comfortable and uh, like an old slipper. They have kept that tradition alive of a family atmosphere with country music. There's not many places that you could actually bring your children, your baby, in a bar and have a good time. We've been together at the spoke from day one. It's always been a mom and pop operation. I couldn't have done it without my wife, Annetta. You know, she helps me every day up there. I'm in charge of BS and PR, and my wife's the working half of the family. I'm raised a straight, innocent Baptist, <laughs> and he taught me to gamble, to drink, <laughs> to cuss. I play here every Tuesday night for the last three or four years, and I mean, I get people here from, from you name it, any country, from Australia all the way to Russia, and they come here because it's the world famous Broken Spoke, and I think that's a testament to what James and Annetta have, have really, really done here, uh, keeping it true to its roots. And I think that's something a lot of things are missing this day and age. When you walk in the bright spot and you open that door, it's like, oh, it's like time stood still. When I came to Austin, Texas, I, I imagined longhorns, um, horses, cowboys, a lot of cowboys, and the broken spoke. It's just like I imagine, yeah, yeah. without longhorns, but <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's so, I mean, it feels like Texas. It's a functioning, living and breathing honky-tonk, and that was what I was hoping might still exist in America. People make pilgrimages because it's a real honky-tonk, and there's none left. <laughs> You know, I built this place back in 1964 uh, with the help of a bunch of good old South Austin boys. And um, I, I kind of kiddingly say uh, every drunken South Austin's worked on this place, you know. And believe it or not, I do not have any blueprints of this building. I mean, I had this kind of, it's all kind of up in my, my brain up here. And I'm also in charge of uh, maintenance, and I do that by what I call band-aiding the broken spoke back together again. And I remember the night when it was pouring down rain out here several times, 
And uh, we used to have to put buckets of you know, bus tubs out here to catch the water. And I mean, it wasn't like one bus tub, it was several of them, because this, this roof really leaked to me, because the roofers I had that helped me, they were pretty good drinkers, you know, and they, they could have did a lot better job than what they did, but all my roofers was drunk, and one of them did fall off this roof back here, and then they ended up getting sick on me. But anyway, that's one reason why this roof leaked. It's been leaked for over 25 years, and I got kind of tired of it, so I said, you know, I'll just get me a, a, a corrugated tin. I'll put a roof upside down. I'll let it go to a drain over here, then down the downspout. I drill a hole in the wall, and then the water came down there, down the downspout, out, out the side of the building, and uh, the roof still leaked, <laughs> but the customers didn't get wet, so it worked out pretty good. And then uh, this is our famous uh, bus crash bar. Um, we used to just call it the back bar, but um, at one time, uh, believe it or not, uh, a bus did come through that wall. Uh, an artist kind of, he came in about four feet. Sometimes I sing these musicians a song. I said, I'll give you the hook line. Where was you when the bus came through the wall? You wasn't even here to hear last call. And, you, and then it goes on and on, but anyway, that's, that's my hook line. <laughs> and I had to deal with a bus being inside here for four days. I just put some police tape around it. And then uh, this is the um, this is the world famous uh, Rogan Spoke Band thing. You can see we got some few uh, beer cans left over. And um, and uh, but this is a sacred stage. Um, you can see it's worn. And you you know people like you know I, I walk Bob Wills up on this stage and Willie Nelson's been up here and. You can just see the indentures where like steel guitars have been, they, they've worn a rut right into this, uh, they, they saddled it all out. That's where the steel guitar usually sets up. And then we had Bob Wills was right here and we had a hole up here in the ceiling. So they said, well, that's Bob Wills' hole. That's where he would fiddle through the ceiling. And the musicians, they like to kind of punch holes in here with the drumsticks and arm then hit it with their fist, you know. But uh, anyway, when, I, when I, we did it, I put plywood behind it where they wouldn't knock it in so easy because every time we had a big star, it seemed like we'd take their picture on stage and here'd be Ernest Tubb up here walking the floor over you and then they have a big old square of missing and my wife said, boy, that looks, that looks bad. Got a big hole in the ceiling right over Ernest Tubb's head. So anyway, we put this thing, but when I was doing that, I found a bunch of beer bottles, I found a bunch of trash, and I found a bunch of marijuana cigarettes and, and stash up here that some musician had left behind. <laughs> the stage is such a low ceiling building, you know, that it's a very low ceiling. Guys like uh, Ray Benson, you know, he has to stand on the floor to keep from his head sticking through the roof, you know, when he's, he's playing here. And they dance right there. And we have a bet every night as to how many people are going to fall into the monitors at my feet, and the record was five. But um, no, it's and everybody's like, hi Ray, I do. I'm singing, I'm singing. <laughs> There's a closeness between the band and the, uh, you know, you put a band up on a big high stage and th that kind of separates you from the audience. It's right down here, you know, the stage is not two feet off the, off the dance floor and 
people, they come dancing by and sometimes they'll be dancing backwards and they fall over the stage. <laughs> Their feet will come out from under them and, and uh, they're like, okay, that's good. <laughs> Just keep going. But pretty girls' glances are sometimes very few. But it's fun watching and you watch them the interactions that they have with each other as they're going around the dance floor. To me, that's interesting. You know, I, I try to interact with them, you know, and kind of flirting with, with the girls, you know, behind their guys' backs that they're dancing with. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. All right. Now remember, if y'all aren't dancing, you can't stand on the side of the dance floor. This is not a concert. This is a honky tonk. You know the difference between a honky tonk and a dance hall, right? A dance hall is where you take your wife to, to dance. A honky tonk is where you go to dance with other people's wives. What's different about the Broken Spoke is, it, it's, it borders, it's got a great border between honky tonk and, and dance hall. Because uh, in the front there, it's got a, a kind of a honky tonk vibe. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's served good food. And, and uh, it's, like I said, it's real intimate and you see the history there. But then uh, you go in the back, it's more like the dance halls, where dance floor is the main thing. and. The band just keeps on going. Most of the time in any other place that we play, we're pretty much playing for ourselves and, and playing, playing the music that we're writing. But in, in here, we play to keep the dancers happy and to keep everyone on the floor. And that's the, that's, we don't make set lists. We play this gig every time just by however the crowd is reacting to whatever that we're playing. You know, the thing about playing the Broken Spoke, it's different than playing everywhere else. And musicians don't understand that when I go on stage at the Broken Spoke, it's not about me, it's about being a dance band leader. You've gotta play polkas, you gotta play shuffles, you gotta play waltzes, you gotta play straight country beats, and you're pretty much living and dying by those four or five beats throughout your show. So if you're gonna go up there and think you're gonna play an acoustic song, I don't care if you're Bob Dylan, People are gonna like boo you off the stage immediately. As a band director, the last thing you wanna do is have a bunch of guitar leads and a bunch of selfish musicians noodling on forever. These things should last about three minutes. Otherwise, you're gonna wear people out. So if you're just gonna go up there and play one George Strait song from the 80s and then five of your originals, they're gonna be like looking at their watch. That's, that's what they expect. They wanna keep moving and keep dancing and you gotta check your ego out and just keep the music going. about it in Texas is it can be white, black, or brown. And there are huge audiences for all that. Dance, the dance hall prevails. Figure this with country music. You know, go watch a, a show from even the traditional Ryman Auditorium, Grand Ole Opry, or go watch Grand Ole Opry on TV. If the performance is good, the most excited the audience can get is they clap in time. They don't dance in Tennessee. Maybe too many Baptists. I don't know what the problem is. But it's always been Texas is dance heaven. In the corner at my table by the jewelry box. Why don't you come and join me when you ain't able to face these hard knocks? Oh, here is where the sorrow is on it. In the corner at my table by the jewelry box. 
she married a, a Texan from from it was part of uh, part of one of the rewards of coming down here all these years. So, so I managed I, I would come down here when we were dating, and we'd go dancing. Well, I say dancing very in a very loose term. We'd come here to the Broken Spoke and go dancing. It was terrifying for me. You know, I was just watching all these great dancers two stepping around the place. But it's an incredible sight. People take their dancing yeah. seriously in this place. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think that's entirely healthy. So we like it when people dance. And I can't dance at all, you know, not a lick. But I like watching people that do, that know how to, and there are people there really know how. I tried to get uh, Annette's daughter to show me how to dance, and she took about two steps with me. She said, that's it, impossible. And we always step to the left to give your brain a start, please. Five, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four. So you're touching on two and four. So three main rules. Number one is you never, ever tell a lead how to dance. Your job is to mimic your lead. So shut up. Then um, number two is don't count to them. Girls, they, they can't, but y'all are just being asinine. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, you treat them like they're stupid. Why the hell would you pick a stupid man? We do what I call the broken spoke swing because it's the only place that, that actually has continued for 50 years, the old classic two-step. Okay, then step to your left. Step, step, small steps, one. You're dancing yourself. So step to your left. Three straight. Touch, touch three straight. Hell yes. Absolutely perfect, my friend. Absolutely perfect. I remember far, as far back as walking around and, and I would hit my head on the tables. Like, I must have been two. She was about <clears throat> table level when she when we opened. Well, yeah, oldest daughter, Terry, she at first she'd throw it out like on two little chairs she slept in when it got around bed night at night, you know, or 11 o'clock. And then she graduated to three chairs, and she graduated to a booth. But uh, she was always with us, and um, that's where she learned how to dance, was at the Broken Spoke. And so now, I guess uh, I, I would call her and which is the true that she is uh, the best uh, country music uh, dance instructor, I mean, that there is as far as I'm concerned. The secret to my lessons is getting in the man's head because he is bored to tears from the moment he steps up there and he doesn't really want to do this. He's only doing it because he's thinking, um, I better get really lucky tonight if I do this. But um, you would be surprised how many men are in very intimidated by their lives because they control what they want. And they are not going to step out of that box. You're my lead. We conform to the lead 100%. You are the anchor. Come here, little sassy bat. Now, zigzag his feet because we're going to give him the opportunity to quit running about stepping on your feet. This bone, this is a man's pocket that your titties go around. You know what I mean? So this goes flat right there. There you go. So step to your left. Two. Ignore her feet, just dance like she's not there. Three straight. Why are you fighting this? First of all, you're dancing without him. If you want me to dirty dance, I will, and then you, you will appreciate him. I tell people that I play music for men and women that want to touch each other in public. Grab somebody, it don't matter what foot you start with, here's how you old-fashioned Texas walls. Here it is. Slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow. Other foot, go one foot, the other foot. Slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, we go. This was the only place that I got comfortable coming to alone. I, I would just come come in and someone would come up to me and ask me to dance. And you've got two people that I've never met before 
They don't know anything about each other. Very often, huge age gaps, it doesn't matter, but you have this connection with this total stranger. It's such an amazing human connection to move in sync with someone else, and dancing to me feels like you're just kind of writing the music. You're writing along on top of it. Bobbing your head only gets you so far. <laughs> The dance tradition never died in Texas, and that's kind of what the whole deal is with the broken spoke. They refer to Saturday as dance night. Dancing in Texas, what a big, huge part of the culture that is. You know, everybody in my family, everybody danced. Everybody we grew up with danced. The band played Westfield, and everyone started to dance. The dance tradition in Texas goes all over the state. You had German and Czech communities that did it. You have Hispanic communities that do it, you know? And Texas music incorporates elements from all of that. This mariachi sound, uh, the polka sound of the Czech bands is a, is a big deal. And it's all went together to make the dance tradition such as we have even today. Texas dance halls are what makes Texas unique. And they used to be in every town, and we played them all, and I miss them. Was the only one I was you know, when people got together throughout Texas history, you know, they'd, get to, they'd have dances, and they had musicians, and people would, would dance, and that was a big, big part of the thing, because it's social interaction, you know, courtship, and, and that whole ritual that that's uh, that goes on around music. It's reminiscent of the early days, you know, when uh, you know the countryside was populated with uh, people off of ranches and cowboys, and uh, it's a, a preservation of a culture that is not so prominent nowadays. Texas pretty much defines what a dance hall is. There are so many of them around here. It's been so deeply rooted for so many years. You know, the thing you do is you, uh, either a Friday or a Saturday, you, you go to a dance hall. You know, you may go to a beer joint all week long or, a, or your favorite honky-tonk or on the Friday or a Saturday, but one of them nights you usually go to a dance hall. It's just, it's kind of Texas culture. Growing up in the Austin area, I, I used to go to a lot of these old honky-tonk dance halls and my parents would take me when I was like eight or nine years old and I always had a lot of fun and that had a great deal of bearing on why I built the Broken Spoke because if it wasn't for me going to these dance halls when I was young having fun, um, maybe I never would have went in that kind of business, you know. At my local break and spot I arrive here every happy hour Exactly on the dot At a little corner table Where nobody bothers me For they know my heart is breaking And I don't walk up a knee Well, here we are at the Broken Spoke and my famous uh, tourist trap is what I call this place right here. Even though I don't really have anything for sale in here, it's just my own, it's kind of like my own personal museum and I enjoy coming back here and um, I can tell stories about every picture. But anyway, this is uh, me and uh, Jerry Jeff Walker. This is three in the morning and I took Jerry Jeff Walker home that morning, and I called, everybody calls that a Jerry duty. <laughs> you know, you have, oh, you had Jerry duty tonight. I said, oh, I guess I did have Jerry duty. Invitation. Then over here, that's me and my wife and, uh, and George Jones there, old Possum Jones. All these people have been here. Like this here, like Dan Rather, he came out here a lot. Kitty Wells, that was, that's right behind the broken spoke. That's her bus in the background. 
And this is my hat collection right here. And then also, uh, Randy Travis, he came out here and he did a, a TV show and he was eating a chicken fried steak and he was kind of standing up because they wanted to leave. And the limo was waiting, they kept saying, hey, come on, come on, let's go. And so uh, he, my wife said, we just take the plate with you. And uh, he sent it back from Nashville saying, uh, great chicken fried steak. <laughs> and then uh, George Strait, I started booking uh, the Ace and the Whole Band. I call it the Ace. You can see right here, it says, you know, the Ace and the Whole Band. That's how I'd put it in the paper. Then at the last, it started putting, featuring George Strait at the Broken Spoke. And um, that went on for a long time. And then when he got that one hit, I remember Tom Foote came up to me and he said, uh, well, George ain't gonna be here tonight because he's up in Nashville recording. So I thought, well, I heard that a lot of times. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people go up there and they record and and uh, it, it doesn't go that far. But this time uh, he hit it big time. Over here, I, I built this case especially for uh, Bob Wills. And uh, in my house, when I grew up as a kid, everybody knew who Bob Wills was. And uh, it was kind of like a household name. Aha, uh -huh, take it away, boys. And so anyway, it was a big, moment for me uh, back in 1966 and 67 and 68, I got to uh, book Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. And I was 25 years old and all them guys at the bar, they figured I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I said, well, you know, I got Bob Wills tonight. And they immediately jumped into this talk, you know, but all oh, hell, he'll be drunk. He won't show up. He'll be chasing some woman or he'll be sick in the hospital. He ain't gonna be here. About that time, Bob Wills opened up her front door and he, and he had his fiddle on his arm and cigar in his mouth and cowboy hat on. And uh, the old drunk at the bar about fell off the bar stool because they said, damn, they started whispering, said, that's Bob Wills. There's just been so many things. I've seen Ernest Tubb here twice, uh, the great Ernest Tubb, and, and uh, uh, Floyd Tillman, and uh, even Tex Ritter, Roy Acuff. Right. This place is, has become uh, a fixture for country music in Texas. Thanks, thanks a lot. I got a broken heart, that's all I've got. This is one of my Uncle Ernest's, Ernest Tubb's great, uh, great staples here in Texas. You know, we call it the Little Austin Opry. You know. This is one of his places that he loved to play. And he could play anywhere he wanted to. It's Ernest Tubb, for Christ's sake. Well, I've got a picture of y'all on stage at the Broken Spoke with Ernest Tubb, and then I got a picture with you and Ernest Tubb on stage, but I showed him to Joe Ely, and he said, well, you know, it was really funny because after we got off the stage, uh, Ernest Tubb says, uh, thank you, little buddies. <laughs> he said, little buddies, he says, uh, uh, I don't really remember what your name is, but uh, the, the one man right there, he wrote, uh, you know, Mr. Bojangles, you know. <laughs> you know, Ernest Tubb, uh, I think that says what kind of place this was. And you are gone, honey, thanks a lot. Thanks. And then uh, 1967, uh, I got a chance uh, to book Willie Nelson and the Record Men. And uh, he had a, uh, a song called Mr. Record Man. Uh, Willie, uh, he used to be uh, a DJ. And so uh, he kind of phrased his song, Mr. Record Man, I'm looking for what a song, song I, heard, I today. heard today. There was someone blue singing about someone who went away. When he came to Broken Spoke, uh, he was clean shaved. And uh, he wore kind of a turtleneck or a sports coat or a vest and had short hair. And uh, I had him a, a lot of years and uh, I booked him for like 800 bucks a night. And uh, over the last 20 some odd years, it didn't really cost me anything because he would just come out, you know, when he could. And he would set in with different bands. And Mr. Record Man, get this record for me. One of the best beer joints ever. Best beer joints ever. And, and Ray Benson said, he said that if you went to the spoke with long hair, you would get your ass kicked and you would get a haircut. You know? And you, you were playing before, you were playing those places before. I went in there to that. see if I could get my to ass kicked. To see if you could get your, how'd that work out for you? Just play some music and they didn't we kick Played some hand. music yeah. and I haven't had any problems yet.
it was always my goal to, to play the broken spoke. You know, we had come from Amarillo, and in Amarillo we were playing to two two separate crowds, which sometimes cross these really wild Amarillo rednecks and cowboys and stuff. And uh, and of course the hippie crowd that was beginning to to pick up on country music, and we were playing. We were the only band in town that was playing Bob Wills. You know, and we were playing a lot of Bob Wills, so the the cowboys or the redneck types, you know, they had to like us, and we actually did have long hair when we were, we were in Amarillo. When we came to Austin, there was some crossover, and there was some, you know, animosity a little bit in the early days, but nothing like it was in Amarillo. I mean, in Amarillo, when we did this, there were fights every single gig. Unlike San Francisco, hippies in Austin embraced and loved and celebrated drank beer. So beer was cool, and then the rednecks discovered pot, and it's like, look out. The hippies and the cowboys got together, and they decided they liked each other okay. So I never did, you know. I used to go into truck stops with long hair just to see what they'd do, and uh, people were trying to change and yeah, accept, you know. It's kind of like the gay thing, thing, you know, people are finally accepting they it. finally and, get over it. And the marijuana thing, you know, yeah. it's not a big deal no not more. Not a big deal. I thought it was something that we could get all those hippies and all them cowboys and all the rednecks all under one roof and started intermingling together and started getting along and, and that's when I started booking Alvin Crow. Oh, the keys in the mailbox, come on in. I'm sitting here wishing, dear, I had your love again. Ask you where you've been. Oh, the keys in the mailbox. Come on in, Johnny Egg. At the time, there was uh, not a lot of bands doing the Bob Wills and Western Swing sort of thing. A lot of the country bands, or what would be called the traditional country bands at the time, we're doing this softer uh, country politan, po country pop sort of thing. And I wanted to focus on the hard hitting country music of, you know, like the early Ray Price and, and Buck Owens and Bob Wills and, and that sort of Hank Williams. I knew from experience it would strike these hippies in the same way it would strike the rednecks. You know, I'd seen it before, and these hippies who had been raised on this country stuff and then moved to, sort of moved away from it, it was sort of bringing them back home. You know, that there's there's no there's no conflict between loving the Doors and loving Bob Wills at the same time. There's not a conflict. You know. Mailbox, come on in. I'm sitting here wishing, dear, I had your love again. I'll never even ask you where you've been. Oh, the keys in the mailbox, come on in. Yes, the keys. Riding down the canyon when the sun goes down, a picture that no artist there should paint. White faced cattle lowing down the mountainside, I hear a coyote howling for his mate. And your cactus blooms are a blooming, sagebrush everywhere, granite spirals are standing all around. 
I tell you, boys, it's heaven to be riding down the trail when the desert sun goes down. Good old cowboy song. <laughs> I don't think we could have had a better day for coming out here today. It's cool, you know, I'm in the shade here and uh, I kind of look out and you can kind of kind of still visualize uh, vanishing Texas and uh, I can look out through here and I don't see any houses out here. I love uh, views like this in Texas and uh, it's just so much better for the mind, you know, for the body and uh, you go down the you know, if you go about 10 miles over this way back into Austin, and then uh, you, you you lose that. I mean, it's it's nothing like this. This is um, this is peace of mind, you know. Anyway, um, we're out here at the James M. White Ranch and uh, at the hill country, the beautiful hill country. I kind of get my strength like uh, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, he always said he'd get his strength from the hill country. And, and I feel the same way when I come up here, you know. But you know, a lot of people, they ask me and say, well, uh, where did you meet your wife? And I said, well, I met her in a honky-tonk, you know? And uh, they said, well, how'd that happen? And I said, well, I was at this old place called uh, the Sportsman Inn out there on Highway 290. It was right across from a roping arena. And me and my girlfriends would go out there because we knew the guys had come over after the roping and the bull riding. And uh, anyway, uh, I seen a pretty blonde girl out there dancing, and she was dancing kind of fast dance. And, uh, she had a, a red dress on, and I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask her for a dance here as soon as she gets through with this dance. And uh, that's, that's when I first met my wife, and way back in about 1961, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. 1961, so she'd been putting up with me all these years. And <laughs> he's a good-looking guy, yeah, but he's a rascal, you know. I was raised pretty straight. And I remember when he called me back up when he got back from overseas, and. I thought, that's James White, huh? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to wear flats. I'll probably walk home because <laughs> he's too fresh. <laughs> One of my best feelings was um, getting on the plane and heading back to stateside. So I got my discharge, but before I did get my discharge, I got thinking, what am I going to do when I get out? And I thought, well, you know, it'd be nice if uh, I could have a place of my own, something similar to what uh, I have at the Broken Spoke today, you know, similar. And um, I got thinking about wagon wheels kind of going around my brain, you know, and I thought, well, you know, I just remember this old movie called uh, Broken Arrow. So I thought, well, hell, I'll just knock, I'll get me a couple of wagon wheels, I'll knock a spoke out, and uh, I'll name it the Broken Spoke. Well, the day I got in the Army, uh, I came underneath the big old oak tree there on Lamar, and there wasn't nothing there but pasture land. There wasn't another building in sight. And I just visualized the place like no other. And um, I named it the Broken Spoke. And uh, it, it was a fun time, we popping that beer. I mean, beer was 25 cents a bottle, and I'd pop it as fast as I could, you know, two in each hand, you know. And, and I'd work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and then she would help, you know, hop tables or whatever I asked her to do with bartending. He said, you have to learn to drink beer. And I said, why? I don't like it. And he said, well, when somebody needs to buy, wants to buy you a beer, you have to be social and accept it. So I learned to drink beer. And I've been on the diet ever since. Got a dead soldier? Y'all come back and see us. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night, sir. I think it's it's a uh, it's an accomplishment that you know husband and wife like me and my wife Annetta can work together all those years and uh, you still know love each and other. still love each other and still get along <laughs> and and still we still get the job done. 
I mean, we have uh, daughters and granddaughters that, that help us, you know. And, but it's still, uh, without us as, as the mainstay or whatever you want to call it, uh, I don't know if, uh, if it would get done quite as well don't as worry. it is today. They all know. <laughs> I might holler a lot and talk a lot about, you do this, you do that, this is the way we're going to do it. But when Dad speaks, <laughs> they better start moving. <laughs> I do all the, uh, all my dad's bling shirts up at the spoke. Like this one has all the beadwork, all the beadwork and the rhinestones. So it takes me about, God, I don't know. It probably took me maybe like six, six months or so to do it, but that's all individually done. People ask me a lot, like, oh, can you make one for me? And uh, I usually say no now, because I can't even do the ones for my dad. And uh, plus, I want him to be the special one with all the rhinestone shirts. I don't want anybody else out there with the rhinestone shirts. Like, he's the star, you know. Thank you. Some of my first memories up at the Broken Spoke, because I've pretty much been there my whole life. I, uh, I, the, first time I went, the first time I was brought there, I was 11 days old, and Ernest Tubb was playing. And uh, that night he sang me a song, and then every time he'd play there, he would sing me a song. He'd go, this goes out to little Jenny. So that's really special. And I remember being out on his bus with him, and I think I was about six years old. And he just had that grandfatherly, very kind, warm, you know, persona. And uh, it's just really good memories. I, it made it like my, ho my other home. But uh, when I was a teenager, I was a horrible teenager. <laughs> and I didn't really want to spend much time up at the Broken Spoke when I was probably about 16, 17. My mom said it went all downhill when they gave me a car. So, uh, but I, I've uh, matured and grew up. And <laughs> I worked up there uh, since I was 18. And uh, I know how to cook. I know how to, I know how to cocktail waitress, but don't like to do it. And... Um, Anyway, I just you have to learn everybody's job, especially when you have a small business. It's like a skeleton crew, so if somebody doesn't show up, you have to do their job. And so sometimes, like if I take the money up there in the mornings and the cook decided not to show up, I was the cook for the day, and my mom knows that because she's been doing it for years. Uh, the guy next to me had a ruby red, red and white. Oh, I know it. I'm in here. I've learned a lot of lessons from my parents. My mom is one of the toughest, hardest working people I know. I mean, she will do anything up there. She will plunge a toilet, she will cook, she will bartend all night long, and she's 70. And when I was a kid, like, uh, you could even take a nap in this house. Like, what are you doing taking a nap? You know, like, we're like, you know, go, let's go, all the time. Like, uh, she said napping makes you lazy. And that's all, right? When I worked at UT, I worked in the auditor's office and I reconciled the bank accounts and a lot of other things. But back in 1966, 64, I wore three inch heels. I walked three blocks and I had to leave the house by 7 a.m. to get a parking place. And so uh, I bitched about the parking every day, I'm sure. And he said, finally in 1969, he said, well, you can quit the job at UT and I'll let you park right out front. The only thing he forgot to tell me was that I got to work 18 hours a day instead of eight. So I get up at seven and do the money, pay all the bills, I pay all the taxes. I'm a very busy person anyway. I can't stand being idle. And I tell my employees all the time, at the spoke, I make everybody do every job except cook. And most of them c couldn't do that if they tried. They can't cook, period. Okay, chicken fried steak. This is just flour and cracker meal. Then you dip it over here. And then we're gonna do it again. 
used to we bred it as we went. But when James decided to put my recipe in the paper one time, the American Statesman, I bred it eight cases that night. My arm was so sore the next day from bread and cutlets. But you know, and the statesman told us later, said, oh, best, best recipe we ever put in the paper. I went, I oh, know. Yeah, and that in the kitchen is tenacious. There's really no other word to describe her. She, um, she whips those boys into shape. You know, she has been doing it. It's her recipes, her food, you know, and she absolutely loves it. And it's something that she takes a lot of pride in. And man, she can crank some food out. And we make gravy twice a day. And you have to be ready to stir. I tell the, the, the we used to have women day cooks. I thought it makes you most, mucho boobs. And then you just kind of lay it in there. You want to be careful, this grease is hot. And you don't call it white sauce like the Yankees either. It's called white gravy. And there you go. Anybody that hardworking is a dying breed. You know, I think the tenacity that it takes to stay in business these days is something that is lacking. And unfortunately, the economy and the growth doesn't necessarily support small businesses any longer. And it makes it very, very hard to stay in business. So, yeah, absolutely, it's a dying breed. Y'all have a good one now. Thank y'all. Have fun. My dad, the life lessons I've gotten from him, people love this about my dad. They love the fact that he uh, stands here at the door on Friday and Saturday, shakes everybody's hands, tells everybody hello. And when he gets off the stage after he's done his speech, he walks through the crowd, he shakes everybody's hands, he takes pictures with whoever wants to take a picture with him. He also never says no to an interview. Any, any time he will get dressed, go up to the spoke, take pictures, because he says, like, you have, to, you have to do that. If you want to have a successful business, you have to be available to people, and he loves it anyway. So, uh, but it's that genuineness that, it, that people don't have that much anymore, and it's that uh, good old boy manners that he has. And uh, people really love that. Thank y'all. Thank you. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm from Canada down here. This is my first time here. Do <laughs> you mind if I get a picture with you? Sure. James treats that door the same way a preacher might treat leaving a church, you know. When you go in and out, he's going to shake your hand, he's going to talk to you, he's going to look you in the eye, he's going to tell you he's real glad you're here. And you know what? He means it. And you can tell that, and you can see that, and you can sense that. How you doing? Doing good. See ya. Thank you for coming out. So uh, I think James standing there, you know, in his, his flashy shirts and, and talking to people as they come and go, that's a very, very big part of the Broken Spoke, you know. My Broken Spoke experience is not a complete experience until I've seen James White and I've gotten to shake his hand. So may that go on forever. And if it doesn't, I don't want to be here when that happens. Thank you for coming out, man. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, man. Whenever you look up to the front and see Mr. White in that red shirt with that yellow tie and a couple hundred people dancing, you know, that's, that's just about the pinnacle of it. And everybody having a good time. You know, no trouble, no work. And he's the most honorable man with the count with everything and, and and there's a couple of times that I didn't I didn't have enough money to really to, to pay the band and Mr. White just put it in. You know, you can't beat that. Can't beat it.
Hi, uh, Dwayne. Um, hi, this is uh, James White from The Broken Spoke. Um, you called up there and uh, said something about you'd like to play at The Broken Spoke, and um, I might have an opening for you. There is a definite chain you got to go through. You don't just start on Friday and Saturday night. I don't uh, you usually got to play on Tuesday night, night, then you go, you might get a Wednesday night, and and Wednesday night, you might get a Thursday night, and you do that for a couple of years, and then you might get a Friday night or a Saturday night. That's just the way he does business, and I tell people, they always ask me, say, hey man, get me a gig at the spoke. I said, I don't have anything open in May. In the music business, people that run venues with a pretty consistent feel and and longevity are what the business is founded on. I mean, you gotta start somewhere as playing, and you gotta have people buy tickets and so forth, you can afford the band. And those kind of places need to be out there, and James is in that long line of good people that has kept it going. And it's not the names that, that draw, it's the club. got this gig, we played a wedding here about a year ago, and um, we set up, came and set up early, and I noticed that Mr. White was still hanging around, and uh, so I made sure that during soundcheck we played a bunch of <laughs> George Strait songs and Haggard songs and stuff that I knew that he would like, that was very danceable stuff, and uh, I could tell that he was listening to us the whole time, so right after soundcheck I went and sat next to him, and we talked, he told me stories about the Broken Spoke, he told me all the stories I'm sure he's told a thousand times, uh, <laughs> but it was my first time to hear him. And uh, a week after that, he asked me if we wanted to pick up a gig, and um, I signed on. <laughs> I know it's gonna be this good, but it, it's my dream, y'all. I get to do exactly what I want to do, and that's run the broken spoke, and uh, and people people let me do it, so I, I can't really ask for anything more, you know, anything better than that. Yeah, I, I feel right at home uh, over here in South Austin. Uh, that's where I was born and bred. Uh, way back in 1939, been on these streets. Uh, but you know, that, this uh, street has changed so much here in the last few years, and 
it's just getting away uh, too many apartment houses and we're losing uh, <clears throat> a lot of the old feel of Austin um, by tearing down a lot of these old buildings and putting up uh, you know fancy hotels and fancy apartment houses and uh, they they call it uh, you know the change and this that and the other and uh, progress and uh, it's just uh, I hope they never get overbuilt but look to me like they're getting too many apartment houses You know, this last decade or so in Austin, you know, the sort of the international cachet, if you will, of Austin has, has increased dramatically. Uh, you know, South by Southwest and other things have really elevated, you know, people's awareness of Austin. And I was always a music fan here in Austin, but was understanding the dynamic of how challenging it is for these venues to even, you know, hang on. I knew how tough it was for them to you know, continue to stay open and, you know, pay the light bill and, and uh, deal with city regulations and code compliance stuff and fire exiting laws, right? James was always quick to, you know, give me his opinion, but always in this pleasant way. We never really talked politics. We would talk, you know, there's going to be encroaching development, obviously. And so how do we, you know, maintain, you know, the broken spoke in light of, you know, a population boom in this town? You know, whether we like it or not, I mean, in the 70s, there was 3.5 billion people on the planet when I was a kid. Now there's almost 7 billion people, okay? We can't do anything about that, you know? The planet's just going to keep growing. Austin's going to keep growing. Um, so don't fight it. Work with it. When I was growing up, we would ride our horses down the shoulder of South Lamar, and it was... You're in the country. My dad, his great aunt and uncle, bought this property back in 1917, and they paid $59 an acre. James White got involved. He was one of my dad's probably first tenants. And my dad and our family owned the land and the buildings all across this area. So when we sold it, you know, everything got sold. And James White's always been the tenant. He owns the broken spoke, but not the building or the land. And we wanted to keep the, the spoke intact. We just wanted to find somebody that wouldn't, wouldn't bulldoze it. And that was quite an endeavor, because everybody just wanted to come in and knock it down and start over and get the best bang for their buck. And um, so it took a while. It was never in, in writing. We did it all verbal, and they honored it. I walked up to a, a, one of my son's soccer practice one time and all the dads were talking about the travesty that was the development around the broken spoke. <laughs> uh, so I joined that conversation uh, and told them that I was building it and it got quiet. When we looked at it, that was the primary thing we loved about it was the fact that the spoke was this iconic dance hall that our vision was always to leave it in the middle of the, of the development. Part of their decision-making process in deciding to sell us the property at that point in time was that we weren't going to move the spoke. There were a number of people that looked into the site. South Lamar obviously is a, a pretty hot corridor uh, with respect to development in Austin, and you know there are five deals going up right now. But uh, the fact that we looked at it, and that was never a consideration, really, to relocate the spoke. It's difficult to say whether if in the future some owner, whoever that may be, will decide to keep the spoke. I cannot imagine that they wouldn't, but, uh, uh, you know, who's to say? Yes, it's horrible. There are those condos and all that, but I, I like what Michael Corcoran wrote, that if you're 21 years old and you've just arrived in Austin, you're gonna look, go down south to Mar and this, in the middle of all this housing, you're gonna stop and say, how cool is this in the middle of those condos? A real honky tonk, I'm home. Gave me none. Oh, well, we ain't be down on your luck, and you ain't got a buck. In London, you're a goner. Even London Bridge is falling down and moved. Arizona now I know why I substantiate the 
the rumor that the English sense of humor is drier than the Texas sand. You can put up your dukes or you can bet your boots. I'm leaving just as fast as I can. I wanna go home with the armadillo. Good country music from Amarillo and Dali. The friendliest people and the prettiest women you've ever seen. Vibe is everything in a club. How many places do you go into, you know, some fake Irish bar, or, you know, some vampire bar that some rock and roll kids own that smell like dog shit inside? And then you go into the spoke and you realize, wow, man. Man, soak it up while you're at the broken spoke because you could be at a frickin' sports bar tonight in Idaho. Well, I decided that I give my cowboy hat and go down to Marble Arch Station. I think I've been there. Cause when I check some fences, he'll take his chances. Chances will be taken, that's for sure. People do realize that it's a unique environment. It's something that's it's more or less, at least for now, is being preserved. But of course, uh, it's fragile. It's fragile. No telling what can happen. We live in a city that's, uh, that doesn't really value in a lot of ways. They say they do, but uh, the, the truth is they haven't shown that, that the city that it values uh, landmark places like the Broken Spoke. So hopefully uh, it'll stay around as long as, uh, as, long as we can. You know? I would have granted James M. White tax exempt status years and years ago, okay? I would have done everything to support this place. And I'm talking about as a politician, whether you're the mayor of, or the governor, you know? We're willing to give Samsung Electronics a tax abatement to put a semiconductor fabrication facility, a fab. We're willing to give Samsung a tax abatement. And that I don't, def, uh, that's fine. But this is important too. This is real important here. It wouldn't cost you nearly as much as Samsung. There should be some sort, there should be some sort of historical importance granted to this, this building and these people. They have been major contributors to the Austin, Texas way of life, and that ought to be worth something. Once I became an adult, I felt like I really owed it to my parents to work up there. And I feel like it's my job to continue it for people, other generations when they come. I, one, of the, one of my favorite things that I always hear from tourists, when they come in, they always say, this is what I thought Texas would be like. And that there isn't that much of Texas, like that old style stuff left. And I don't know what to expect, like if, when, and when he isn't around. But I hope that it stays as popular it is, as it is. And I hope I honor him. Sorry. <laughs> It was, it's just very important. Um, I know he wants it to keep going for a long time. He's built up a very big legacy, and he never dreamed that it would be this big when he started it. He said he just didn't. 
He just started a dance hall. He didn't know that it would grow to this. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to keep it the same because that's what he wants. There will never be any rock bands at the Broken Spoke or no rappers. And I'm not saying that's some bad. I listen to a little bit of rock and roll, but... I mean, that's not what he wants. He doesn't, he wants it to be country and he's stayed, he's stuck to that. And I think that's one of the other reasons why it's, it's still going so strong because it's, it's always that, like he doesn't ever deviate to something else. So um, hopefully the building will uh, be able to withstand those many years. <laughs> but as long as we can uh, keep it in one piece, that's just, uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep it going. Three, Why don't you put your hands together while we're on the stage, Mr. James M. White. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Alvin. Thank y'all. We want to welcome y'all to Broken Spoke, the last of the true Texas dance halls, and darn sure proud of it. We ain't fancy, but we're doing short country. We're gonna do this, we ain't gonna change nothing. We ain't getting nothing hanging fern baskets on our ceiling out here. Now that Pierre water either. When you go up on all your hamburger, don't ask for that great Poupon. You're getting the real mustard out here. Well, let me tell you what we do got. We got cold beer, good whiskey. We are the home best chicken fried steak in town. And we got good country music. We got Alvin Crow and the Pleasant Valley Boys tonight. If you like waltzes and polkas, two steps, cotton, I joke. Deep in the heart of Texas, there's a place that you should go. It ain't fancy, but it's country. Wear your jeans and your cowboy hats. Just cross that old river, cause that's where it's at. It was born on the south side of Austin. Broke and spoke with his name. It'll always be a winner. It's destined for fame. With hammers and nails, they built it. With, with Texas, Texas style on their mind. After how many years have been out there? Oh, about 50 years. Still one of a kind. It's a red, rustic old building with a dirt parking lot. There's a big old oak tree by the highway that means quite a lot so if you like waltzes and polkas two-step cotton on joes deep in the heart of texas there's a place that you should go yes deep in the heart of texas there's a place that you should go all right thank you all the spoke thank you very much has 50 years of the nightlife been a good life for you? Oh, I think I think the 50 years is, is uh, you know, we look at people we went to school with. They're all old, go to bed at <laughs> 9 o'clock, using walking canes. And I'm like, I'm glad we, we were in nightlife, you know, because we stay up every night till at least midnight. And then, you know, we close at 1, so sometimes it's 2 or 3. But... Uh, I think we've stayed younger because we're more active. That's my opinion, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I think uh, the 50 years went by real quick. And then again, you know, I look back and I think, you know, that's a long time ago. It's kind of like a, and I, I, always, I tell people, I said, well, I said, well, <laughs> with these hands in this place, it's, it's, it's my life's work. Mm -hmm. 